I'm hoping to talk today a lot about social connection, not, not particularly a lot about depression, a lot about mental health in general, but social connection and loneliness and how that affects us as a society, how it affects us as individuals and how we can try and break through together. And it's, the together is the important part of that sentence because we can't break through loneliness alone. We can't do it on our own. We can do some things on our own and we can push ourselves on our own, we can do more activities on our own, but we can't break through loneliness on our own. And so thinking about social connection and how we as a group and we as a country can work through some of those things. So let's see if this all works. So if you're old enough like me, then you all remember Michael Stipe and the song Everybody Hurts. And that, that what kind of struck me when we were talking about loneliness in the idea that actually everyone feels lonely. There's nothing unusual about feeling lonely. Loneliness isn't particularly to do with depression. It's not particularly to do with anxiety. Loneliness is just there as a normal human emotion. We feel happy, we feel sad, we feel excited, and sometimes we'll feel lonely. And that's good. That's what, what the human beings do. But it becomes a difficulty when we feel lonely all the time. Or we start to feel lonely when really we don't want to feel lonely. Or we don't have a way out of feeling lonely. And that's when it becomes a real problem. And there's a kind of irony to loneliness. Because everyone, everyone in this room has felt lonely in their time. People may have, lots of people in the room will have felt lonely today. Everyone feels it. And that kind of proves something to us. It means we're not alone. Actually, what I'm feeling is the same thing that you're feeling, which is the same thing the person next to you is feeling. Sometimes we feel quite isolated and alone, but we aren't. The people beside us are actually going through many of the same things as well. And so, in the last 10 years or so, governments and big organizations have really started to measure loneliness. Because they've started to see that it's a really important thing to look at. It has an impact on our overall health. It has an impact on our overall well-being. And so, to th this comes from The Economist, and it's a, large, a, lot, a lot of the, the research comes from the UK and from the US. And so, what it's saying is that 80% of people, so if you just look at the US, 80% of people are feeling lonely regularly. And 5% of those people find that it's a major problem. 15 almost 15% of people find it's a minor problem, and then 25% of those people find that it's not a major problem, that they're happy enough with where they are. And it's very much the same in Britain, and it's obviously quite different in Japan. But I want to contrast that with maybe your own ideas about loneliness. Because often when we feel alone, we feel, well, I'm the only one. Everyone else has friends. Everyone else is going out all the time. Everyone else is out doing things. Not that huge percentages of the population actually feel exactly like this too. Or not that huge percentages of the population feel that this is a real problem too. When we look at Australia, one in four adults feel lonely regularly. One in two adults feel lonely uh, at least one day in the previous week. Just over one in two Australians feel they lack companionship sometimes. One in two Australians sometimes feel alone always. One in three Australians never or rarely feel part of a group of friends. One in four don't feel they have a lot in common with the people around them. And one in five rarely or never feel close to people. That's a huge amount of people. So if we take and we think Australia is actually, it's a pretty outgoing, it's a pretty friendly country. You think Australia, apart from being sunny, is pr pretty similar to Ireland. If you're saying one in four people in Ireland, that's a million and a bit people. That's not one person. That's not just me on my own. That's a million plus people in Ireland. If you're saying one in five people rarely or never feel close to people, that's up at 800,000 people. How many is 800,000 people? Well, it's five times the city of Cork. It's all of the north side of Dublin. I don't know if we could, if we cut Ireland off at the Shannon, would we get 800,000 people? So it's an enormous amount of the country. And they're feeling lonely, and they're feeling lonely all the time, or at least lots of the time. The UK recently 
got there, developed a loneliness minister in the government. They think loneliness is such an important area and it needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed in older people and younger people, people in hospital, people coming out of hospital. They don't, people don't think of loneliness just as a mental health issue. They see it as a health issue altogether. It's just a quality of life issue. So they have a loneliness minister and they have a department of loneliness. And that seems like a very strange idea, but it's a subset of the Department of Health. It's like having a minister for old age, or we, Catherine Zappone is the minister for children. It's like having the same idea that they have a minister for loneliness. And so these are some of the things that are coming out of the UK. Seven in ten people know a friend who is lonely. Now that's quite important, because if you ask in a questionnaire, are you lonely, lots of people will lie. But if you ask a friend, do you know any friends who are lonely, they'll all say yes. And so actually it's probably a better indicator of how many people feel lonely themselves than asking directly, how lonely do you feel? 92% of people find it difficult to tell other people they are lonely. 13% of us feel lonely all the time. 33% of people believe others think there's something wrong with them if they feel lonely. 92% of us think people are scared to admit they are lonely. In the UK, a million people aged 65 plus always or often feel lonely. Two and three people know someone who is lonely. And so just recognising that this is in every country, in every culture, it's in the country, it's in the city, it's in the young and it's in the old. And that it affects us in lots and lots of different ways. And we're going to talk in particular this evening about how it affects us in terms of depression, because you know, that's the evening that we're having, but actually thinking that this is just how to feel good about life. And this is an important about how, way to, about how to live and how to live well. So there's really consistent evidence that loneliness can cause physical pain. You know, we say we feel lonely, but that we feel, actually feel that in our body. It increases stress and it can lower our immune system. So we're more inclined to get physical illnesses. There's also consistent evidence that social, the opposite, social connection, releases oxytocin, which is a neurochemical in our brain. And oxytocin reduces stress, increases our tolerance for discomfort, and improves attention and decision making. It's, it's a happy hormone, if you like. And so often oxytocin is released during childbirth. People would often recognize it in those conversations. When we're breastfeeding, because it creates bonds and it cre creates connection between the mother and the baby. It is this happy hormone that gets released and it connects us to other people. And we enjoy that feeling. So this is an MRI picture of the brain. And the, the person in this study has been so the, the way the study has been set up, they've experienced a piece of social exclusion. They've, they've set up, a, it's in a lab, it's in a university, but they've felt a little bit excluded within that social situation. And a part of their brain lights up. Now this happens to be the same part of the brain that feels physical pain. So they aren't experiencing any physical pain, there's nothing happening in the lab that's painful, but they do feel a little bit lonely. And that's how the brain registers it. And if we do the opposite, if we get someone comes into a university lab and we form a little bond, you get someone to have a laugh with someone, have a little bit of a connection with someone, and they measure how that looks, a whole other areas of the brain light up. And in this case, it's an area called the orbital frontal area, and that's associated with planning and reasoning and decision making. And so one of the things that comes out of that is the suggestion, actually, we think better when we're with other people. And we think better when we're feeling happier. And so there's something about seeing this. We often think about loneliness as something out in the air. It's something hard to put our finger on. It's hard to discuss. We don't like to admit it. It's kind of shameful. It's hard to say, well, what is it or where does it happen? But actually, it's very intrinsically entrenched in who we are. We are a social animal. We live in cities, we live in communities. There's very few types of people that actually live alone on the mountain as the hermit. Most of us cluster together. 
as we evolved, we grew up in tribes, we get married, we live in families, and we, we work as a, as a pack often. And that's fine, that works, it works well to an extent. But then if we feel excluded from the pack, or we feel excluded from the tribe, then that has a real painful impact on us. That has a really strong feeling on, on us. And it's not a feeling that's immediate, we don't wake up in the morning and it's really obvious sometimes. It's sometimes a feeling that grows slowly over time until we realize, actually, this isn't a nice situation. I, I don't enjoy this. So this is a picture of a man who looks really wise. You know, so if you go through the internet and find what's the wisest looking person, this is Martin Buber probably looks like the wisest looking person. And he's an Israeli philosopher, and he lived in the, the early part of uh, the 20th century. And he wrote a lot of philosophy, which is great. And his basic idea was that people are intrinsically oriented towards other people. So when you talk to a psychologist, they'll often talk about people on their own. What's your personality, or how does your brain work, or you know, what's going on for you? And if you talk to a doctor, they'll talk about how your lungs work, or how your you know, back works, and so on. And Martin Buber thought that's not how people work. That people are intrinsically connected to other people. How are we? I am as good as I am, as good as my connections are. And so we can be forward, we can be backward, we can be sideways. And he argued that we are you word. And so we walk into a room, and I am either comfortable with somebody coming near me or I'm uncomfortable with somebody coming near me. I'm happy to be having the conversation or I'm unhappy, but I can't really be neutral about it. No matter what it is, if, I, if, there's, a, if there's another person, then that's going to affect me. And it's going to affect me in a positive way, which we hope is mostly, or it's going to affect me in a negative way. But it's really very hard not to be connected that there is something about the human being that is intimately connected with all the other human beings that they meet. And that that's fundamental to who we are. And I think it's an interesting idea, because especially in the West, we talk about ourselves a lot on our own. How am I? How are you? How are things? And not, how are we? And what, not, what is the connection between us? And so, Within that, if, if we are intrinsically connected, if we are intrinsically related to each other, then where is loneliness? And loneliness is just another part of our body giving us a signal. It's saying you're hungry. You're hungry for other people. So in the same way, you might wake up in the morning and if you skip your breakfast, your body's going to tell you you're hungry, you're, you missed out on something. Or I had a really small dinner coming here this evening because I was kind of racing across town. So if I'm hungry afterwards, it's telling me, well, you skipped your dinner, you better go eat something. That if you feel lonely, your body is telling you, actually, you're hungry for something. You're hungry for a chat, or you're hungry for a laugh, or you're hungry to meet up, or you're hungry for something else that's going on. And it's not a bad thing. It's universal. Every single person feels it. It isn't a shameful thing. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with us, no more than there's something wrong if we get hungry or thirsty or anything else. It just says, actually, there's something inside of us that needs to be fed. And then we need to think about how to do that. And sometimes that's not easy, but we need to think about how to do it. Now, that's life in general, and that's human beings in general. One of the things we know about mental health is that often it exacerbates isolation. That if we're having mental health difficulties, then it's harder to stay in contact with people, or it's harder to stay in college, or it's harder to stay in school, or it's harder to stay in work. It's sometimes hard to communicate. Even if people are there, it's hard to share. And so even though we might be with people or people are around us, it's harder to keep that connection. And there's bundles and bundles of evidence of that. And so, even though treatments might work in some respects, and the medication might be helpful, or the therapy might be helpful, actually the human connection might still be, feel reduced. 
we still mightn't have reconnected with the people around us, or we still might find that really difficult. And so, even if something is good and helpful and we're back feeling our mood is back in some way, actually, it's not unusual at all for people to still to have social difficulties. And you'd meet someone six months later or a year later and say, how things are going, fine, fine, fine. But, you know, are you seeing your friends? Well, only now and again. Or I text them on WhatsApp, but I don't, they don't you know, they only text back now and again. Or we meet up once a month, but we used to be meeting up a couple of times a week. And actually, the, their mood might be back in a, in a reasonable place, but their social connections have taken a, a real hit. And the, the real kicker about that is that we also know that one of the leading reasons for relapse is isolation. And so if we feel really alone and then we start to have the symptoms of a relapse, then actually we don't have as much support. We are, it's easier to feel very sad, it's easier to feel depressed, and it's easier to fall back into a relapse. So we know that isolation can be really challenging. So we know that isolation comes out of depression and mental health problems. We also know that it can re-trigger them. And given all of that, one of the things that's always surprising to me is we'll it be in a phenomenal hospital like this or in any service anywhere in the country. Actually, how many clinicians will ask about loneliness? And really very few. Or how many treatments are there for loneliness? Really very few. How many you know, appointments do we have? Do we have a loneliness doctor? Do we have a loneliness therapist? Do we have you know, someone who works on our loneliness? Actually, that's not really what services are geared around. But we know social connection is really important in feeling happy. And we know social isolation is really important in causing relapse. And so it would seem like actually services should be geared, or one of the things they should be geared around is actually helping us stay connected with other people. So one of the things to think about is, well, what happens when we feel lonely? And what happens when we feel lonely often is we withdraw a little bit. We pull back into ourselves. We protect ourselves a little bit. So if I send out a WhatsApp message and nobody gets back to me, and that, that feels a little, a little, hurts a little bit, so I'm much less likely to send out another one. Or I'm much less likely to ring the next day and ring that person and say, great, let's meet up, how are things going? You know, this is super. Because I'm not going to protect myself. I'm going to withdraw a little bit. And if I send out another WhatsApp message and nobody gets back to me, well, then I'm going to withdraw a little bit more. And if I ring someone and says, yeah, no, it'd be great to meet up. We'd love to see you. I haven't seen you in ages. I'll give you a ring next week. And the person doesn't ring us next week, well, it's pretty hard to expect us to go back again and say, OK, you know, and go back again and to go back again. So when we feel lonely, we often protect ourselves. And to do, when we do that, we withdraw. We pull into ourselves. And our confidence goes down a little bit. And then it's harder to do the things that break out of isolation. So if we look at the pink the arrows, loneliness increases the likelihood of depression by about 15%. But being depressed increases the likelihood of being lonely by about 10%. That it's a vicious circle between the two. Loneliness increases the likelihood of experiencing anxiety when we're in social situations by about 13%. And then being anxious in social situations increases the chance of being lonely by about 9%. And again, there's this vicious cycle between the situation we're in, feeling lonely, and then that making symptoms worse. And that means it's much harder to have the confidence to do something new or to go back to something old. Or to see new people or to go back to old people. And as I sort of said, there's actually very few treatments that help us do that, that help us along the way. Oh, I'm going to take a pause for a second, just judging the room a little bit. 
I probably should have started with a trigger warning that this is a very depressing, <laughs> very depressing uh, talk. Because it's a talk about something that's difficult. Loneliness by its, by its nature is sad. So we're going to take a pause for 30 seconds right now and we're going to do the opposite of loneliness. We're going to turn to the person next to us and we might know them or we might not know them. But we're going to say hello, we're going to shake hands and we're going to either smile or say something funny or say, isn't your man an Egypt? Or we're going to do something, but we're going to do it left and right. We're not going to do it up and down. We're going to <laughs> I'm good. I'm you feeling lonely. Are you? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Now look around the room. Look how everyone looks. Look how everyone feels. Everyone is chatting. Everyone is laughing. Ha! I go home now. <laughs> Get a taxi. Head on. I'll, I'll, br I'll bring you all back. I'll bring you all back. Look how everyone feels. Look how that was. Look how the room changed. That's it. But that's exactly it. Sense of belonging. Yeah, sense of belonging. And it is as complicated and as simple as that. That when everyone was on their own, facing forward, looking at the screen, and we were talking about the very sad things, you could just see the shoulders slump. You could see everyone in the room kind of get down a little bit. And then when we stopped looking forward, and we started looking at the people, we started connecting to the people on the left and the people on the right, suddenly there's chat going on all over the place. There's loads of smiles. There's loads of laughs. There's loads of things happening. And the room feels good. And it feels a bit better. And that's it. That's the whole story right there. There is no treatment for loneliness other than the one you just did. And it worked, and it was brilliant, and you feel better for it. And there's no pill for loneliness, and there's no hospital for loneliness, because you already know how to do it, and you already do it really well. It's built into you. And when you do it, that's what you get. The room changes, the mood changes, your face changes, your body changes, all those neurochemicals change. And so everything we're going to talk about, you already know. But it is doing that really hard thing of breaking the barrier with the person to your left and to your right. And that I'm not in any way saying that that's a small barrier. Because I wonder how many people, if I hadn't asked people to do it, how many people really would have done it? I might give a nod to someone or how many a grant, yeah. <laughs> and then go for the bus. But actually, to have that chat, to break that barrier, it takes a lot of confidence, it takes a lot of guts, it takes a lot of energy, but it works. People feel better when they have it. And it doesn't take a huge amount. It doesn't, you know, you, you aren't chatting for an hour. You're chatting for two or three minutes. And it works. And we need loads and loads of those little two and three minuteses. And so there's a whole movement uh, out in the world of psychology um, which is talking not about therapy and not about medication, but is talking about what they call the social cure, which is you know, a, a very complicated way of talking about chat, crack of his kill, and talking about you know, saying hello to someone. 
and th th this is a, a group of researchers in Queensland and Australia and they do a huge amount of research in this area and they publish a lot on it and there's a lot of science to back it up but it's stuff your granny could have told you that actually chatting over the hedge and talking to your neighbours and talking to the people you meet and talking, you know, the person next to you and face to face and hand to hand and eye to eye that we feel better with it. And so they have had this you know, overall idea of the social cure, not the talking cure, not the chemical cure, the social cure. And it's based on a theory, naturally, which is about social identification. We'll talk about that for a sec. And they uh, have set up kind of six session groups, called, which they run in general health hospitals. So like Vincent's, you know, it's not actually, it's, it's in Australia, but like Vincent's in the matter, those kind of, you know, physical health hospitals, because people coming out of hospital are often feeling a bit isolated and struggling a little bit, and people meet six times and try and get back in, connected with the, their network. And so social identification theory, on the one hand, I can see myself as just the dot on your left, and there's me, and I have my personality, and my likes, and my dislikes, and who I am, and my history, and my hopes, and all the things that are inside me. And often, when we're in treatment, or you know, going to a doctor or anything, that's what we get asked about. And social identification theory is, it's me, but it's all my other bits. So I'm also a brother. I'm also a dad. I'm also a Leinster fan. I'm also a football fan. I'm also Irish. I'm also Dublin. I'm also, I'm connected to all of these other things. I like this type of music. I like that type of coffee. I like these type of groups. And that I am me not on my own. I am, my, I, my idea of myself is all these social groups. This is my tribe. And you can't really understand me unless you see my tribe. And try to think of ourselves that way. And so we can think of ourselves as the personal self, which is just my stuff, and the social self, which is my tribe, and then the collective self, which is Ireland as a country. And I, mean, I don't really want to get into it, but I think Brexit has been hilarious, if only for one thing, how unified the Irish people are against Brexit. We certainly all know what, what we're for. <laughs> we're for Britain remaining in the EU <laughs> and against like 100% approval and we're all for anti-Brexit. And we all know exactly that. And Ireland has never agreed on anything. But we all agree that we don't like Brexit. And that's our collective self. And every now and again the collective self comes out. In Italia 90 the collective self comes out. When Love and Hate, Love, Hate was finishing on TV, the collective self came out. You know, and so those things are, are, are there too. And it's not just to talk about ourselves on our own, but actually to connect in with those other bits. And then we feel happier. And then we feel not as alone. And so social connection gives us a sense of tribal connection. And it gives us a sense of purpose. So... If you say, well, what do you want to do? Well, often you want to do something for other people. I want to be a good member of my family, so it has to involve those. Or I want to be part of my local club, so it involves those people. Or I want to be part of this group, or I need to do that. And so the people around us who are important to us, whether they be friends or neighbours or whatever else, uh, that that actually then becomes our meaning and our purpose and our goals. And it's very hard to have meaning and purpose and goals without those people. Does that make sense for people? Is that? Yes. And if you think about this tribe, and some of you may know each other, lots of people won't know each other, but you're all here tonight. You're all here on a Wednesday evening. You're all here on a certain journey, and all, everyone's journey will be a little bit different. But also everyone's journey is going to have a few similarities. And you're either all on that journey on your own, or you're all on that journey together. 
and that this doesn't have to be a personal journey on its own. It can be a collective journey. And the people with you can help you along on that journey. And their story won't be identically the same. And there's young people and old people and people from every corner of the country and so on. But they can be there with you. And that will make that easier and will make it better. And it's very easy to get into our own, you know, to be trapped on our own. But everyone here is, is trying to go in the same direction. And it's much easier to do that together. So, the next bit is how do you do it? So it's all very well saying we should be doing it. And it's all very well saying this is something we want to do. But actually the how of it, especially if you're feeling depressed or especially if you're feeling anxious, is the tricky bit. So we're going to talk through a few ideas about how. But to be honest, you already know. There's nothing up here that you don't know. It's that bit about breaching across that kind of sense of, can I do that? Am I able to say hello to the person next to me? Am I able to say, how are you? Am I able to send that text? Am I able to reach out in that little bit? And then when we reach out, sometimes negative stuff comes back, but often good stuff comes back. And that that's the things that we need. So, the, the acronym here is often EASE. E-A-S-E. -E. And E is for extend yourself. So when we withdraw, you know, it comes from a sense of being threatened, that this is a threatening place to be. And to overcome that, we need to gradually, so we don't, we don't have to throw ourselves in, and compassionately to ourselves, we don't have to beat ourselves up about it, extend ourselves out into the world and connect. And you've already done that tonight. You've already done it firstly by coming to a lecture, to coming to a public place to talk and think and, uh, about depression. And then you've already done it by chatting to the people around you. You've already extended yourself twice in the last hour. And so it's just doing that slowly and gradually and compassionately and doing it a little bit every day. And the place to start here is with the smallest step. You don't have to start with climbing Mount Everest. You just start with what will be one text? What will be one hello? What will be one how are you? That person that I meet all the time, I don't actually know their name. <laughs> but we've been meeting for 10 years now and it's really embarrassing. <laughs> actually, we can find out their name. And so extending yourself is going to be a key part of that. A is for organising that a bit, a bit. A is for action plan. That we can't just extend ourselves kind of willy-nilly. And if you walked in the door here and started shaking hands with everyone in the room, people would think you were running for politics, you know, running for election. And that, that seems strange. So we need a little bit of a plan. Who am I going to call? You know, who am I going to text? Who am I going to have a cup of coffee with? Who do I want to do? say hello to? Who do I want to connect with? And the, that wanting it is kind of important. And you should base it kind of on who do you know? So who's already there? And what do you like? So rather than just connecting with people randomly on the 46A who you may or may not get on with, actually, what are your interests? What do you enjoy? What do you get a lot from? And who else do we know that also likes that? And actually, that's a pretty good basis for getting on. If you both like Liverpool, this is a good year to both like Liverpool. So it's a time to talk about it. Uh, <laughs> there's a man in the front row who I shouldn't have said that about. <laughs> there's. Also, and this is a very complicated slide, you can map it out. There's me, but also, who are all my other people? What else can I do? And so, there's me, and then there's the people I meet when I walk the dog, and then there's the people I do yoga with, 
and then there's that family I met once when I was on holidays, and then if I join a choir, or there's other people who are vegetarian, I don't really know them, but if I meet them, that's a connection, because we have that in common. Other people in school, all my friends, colleagues in work. And so those are people at very different levels. There's this, you know, the strangers, more or less, that I meet dog walking, or there's my oldest friend, but they're all part of my connections. Because to be honest, the dog walking people I might meet more often. I might see them every day. Or my colleagues in work, I'm actually saying hello to them. Am I actually meeting up with them? You know, connecting in some way with them. Or do we just kind of nod at each other and keep going? And so sometimes the people we know the best, actually we see the least often. And it's the people we see the most often are actually really good people to kind of connect with. You don't need to be hilarious. You don't need to be a comedian. You don't need to be extraordinary. You don't need to be something out of this world. You just need to be a fairly genuine human being. That's all anyone else is looking for. Volunteering is a brilliant way to be social because you'll find loads of people in that organization who want the same things as you. If something is important to you, then actually you're going to immediately meet people who have the same passions as you do. Lots of people now have a million and one Facebook friends. That's fine. What would it be like to actually meet someone and have a coffee? and break through that barrier. And no one expects that of your whole Facebook you know, friend list. That's not what those, you know, that kind of connection is. But for one or two people, that actually might be really appropriate. You haven't seen them in a year, haven't seen them in 10 years. Actually, now is the time to meet up. And not just to do it vaguely, but you get it in the diary. I'll meet you on the 20th of October. I'll meet you at such and such a place. You know, and make it very concrete. And that's what you're trying to do. So you want just small, consistent steps in the direction you want to go. Nothing dramatic, just steady and moving in one way. After A is S, you have to select your goals. And the solution to loneliness isn't the quantity. We don't need 100 people. Maybe we need five. It's the quality. Are the people we have good? Do we enjoy them? Do we get something from them? And that might be the dog walking people. It might be the people we meet in the shop every day. It might be the chat. Who do you know and what do you like? And you pick something that's going to work for you. And then this is quite hard. And it's quite hard if your mood is low or you're not feeling good about yourself. But if I go into a social interaction and I'm down, and I'm not looking, and I'm not talking, and you can even hear it on the mic, then it's very hard for anyone else to connect with me. And actually, if I go in and I'm very pessimistic, I think, oh, this is never going to work, I'm not going to get on, I'm not going to say anything, that's very hard, actually, for anything to come out. And you kind of have to go on, even if you don't fully believe it, go in and expect the best. I'm going to have this chat, it's going to be grand, we'll get on fine, not necessarily going to get married and live happily ever after, but this five minutes is going to be fine. And coming into something expecting the best. And we almost have to go out of our way to go in to each little interaction expecting the best. Because if we go in expecting the worst, then other people kind of read that off us and kind of go, they don't know what's going on. It's fine. They find it hard to connect with us. So, if I was drawing out my map, I might have me, I might have Kula GAA, I might have Aware, I might have men's sheds out here, I might have old school friends, and they're all floating around there somewhere in my life, someone I see every now and again, someone I wouldn't see very often, someone I have no real connection with, someone I have a really strong connection with. And what we're trying to do is actually build, so to say, actually, that's me. That's a really good map of who I am. Now, actually, can I, you know, in a fairly organized way, in a 
fairly methodical way, try and make sure that actually I'm connecting with those people when I'm there. That when I'm in that situation, then I'm just chatting and talking and interacting. You know, and when I'm, you know, if I'm in Kula, then I'm chatting about GAA. And if I'm in Aware, then I'm chatting about whatever is important. And if I'm meeting old school friends, we're chatting about old gossip, and that's grand. But that when I'm there, that I'm, I'm connecting. And one of the things that's kind of coming out of Australia and coming out of the research in London is if we do that, actually we feel better. We have fewer relapses. People's depression comes back less often. And in general, our quality of life is higher. And so it, that is worth the effort. And it is an effort, and it is a little bit slow. But actually br building up that social connection is really, really useful. And that's, as, that's the whole talk. That's everything I wanted to talk about this evening. And uh, we're going to stop now for Q&A. And thank you very much.